Section 1 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Berengaria of Navarre, Part 1. Berengaria, the beautiful daughter of Sancho the Wise, King of Navarre, was first seen by Richard Cour de Lyon, when Count of Poitou, at a grand tournament given by her gallant brother at Pampeluna, her native city. Richard was then captivated by the beauty of Berengaria, but his engagement to the fair and frail Alice of France prevented him from offering her his hand. Berengaria may be considered a Provencal princess, by language and education, though she was Spanish by descent. Her mighty sire, Sancho the Wise, had for his immediate ancestor, Sancho the Great, called the Emperor of all Spain. He inherited the little kingdom of Navarre, and married Beatrice, daughter of Alfonso, king of Castile, by whom he had three children, Berengaria, Blanche, and one son, Sancho, surnamed the Strong, a hero celebrated by the Provencal poets for his gallant exploits against the Moors. He defeated the Mira Molin, and broke, with his battle axe, the chains that guarded the camp of the infidel, which chains were afterwards transferred to the armorial bearings of Navarre. An ardent friendship had subsisted, from boyhood, between Richard and Sancho the Strong, the gallant brother of Berengaria. A similarity of pursuits strengthened the intimacy of Richard with the royal family of Navarre. The father and brother of Berengaria were celebrated for their skill and judgment in Provencal poetry. Berengaria was herself a learned princess, and Richard, who was not only a troubadour poet, but as acting sovereign of Aquitaine, was the prince and judge of all troubadours, became naturally drawn into close bonds of amity with a family, whose tastes and pursuits were similar to his own. No one can marvel that the love of the ardent Richard should be strengthened, when he met the beautiful, the cultivated, and virtuous Berengaria, in the familiar intercourse which sprang from his friendship with her gallant brother, but a long and secret engagement, replete with hope deferred, was the fate of Richard the Lion-Hearted and the Fair Flower of Navarre. Our early historians first mention the attachment of Richard and Berengaria about the year 1177. If we take that event for a datum, even allowing the princess to have been very young when she attracted the love of Richard, she must have been twenty-six, at least, before the death of his father placed him at liberty to demand her hand. Richard had another motive for his extreme desire for this alliance. He considered that his beloved mother, Queen Eleonora, was deeply indebted to King Sancho, the father of Berengaria, because he had pleaded her cause with Henry the Second and obtained some amelioration of her imprisonment. Soon after Richard ascended the English throne, he sent his mother, Queen Eleonora, to the court of her friend, Sancho the Wise, to demand the Princess Berengaria in marriage. For, says Vinasoff, he had long loved the elegant girl. Sancho the Wise not only received the proposal with joy, but entrusted Berengaria to the care of Queen Eleonora. The royal ladies traveled from the court of Navarre together, across Italy, to Naples where they found the ships belonging to Eleonora had arrived in the bay. But etiquette forbade Berengaria to approach her lover till he was free from the chains of Alice. Therefore she sojourned with Queen Eleonora to Brindisi in the spring of 1191, waiting the message from King Richard, announcing that he was free to receive the hand of the Princess of Navarre. It was at Messina that the question of the engagement between the Princess Alice and the King of England was debated with Philip Augustus, her brother. And more than once, the potentates assembled for the crusade, expected that the forces of France and England would be called into action, to decide the right of King Richard, to give his hand to another lady than the sister of the King of France. The rhymes of peers of Langtoft recapitulate these events with brevity and quaintness. Then spake King Philip, in grief said, 
my sister Alice, is now forsaken, since one of more riches of Navarre hast thou taken. When King Richard understood what King Philip had sworn, before clergy he stood, and prove on that morn, that Alice to his father a child had borne, which his sire King Henry held for his own. A maiden child it was, and now dead it is. This was a great trespass, and against mine own witten, if Alice I take. King Philip contended that Richard held in his hand his sister's dower, the good city of Gisors. Upon this, the king of England brought the matter to a conclusion, in these words. Now, said King Richard, that menace may not be. Thou shalt have ward of Gisors thy city, and treasure ilk a deal. Richard yielded him his right, his treasure and his town, before witness at sight, of clerk and eke baron. His sister he might marry, wherever God might like, and, to make certainty, Richard acquittance took. The French contemporary chroniclers, who are exceedingly indignant at the repudiation of their princess, attribute it solely to Eleonora's influence. Bernard the treasurer says, The old queen could not endure that Richard should espouse Alice, but demanded the sister of the king of Navarre for a wife for her son. At this, the king of Navarre was right joyful, and she traveled with Queen Eleonora to Messina. When she arrived, Richard was absent, but Queen Joanna was there, preparing herself to embark next day. The Queen of England could not tarry, but said to Joanna, Fair daughter, take this damsel for me to the king your brother, and tell him I command him to espouse her speedily. Joanna received her willingly, and Eleonora returned to France. Piers of Langtoft resumes. She be left Berengare, at Richard's coast stage. Queen Joanna held her dear, they lived as doves in cage. King Richard and King Tancred were absent on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Agatha, at Catania, where Tancred must have devoutly prayed for the riddance of his guest. Richard here presented the Sicilian king with a famous sword, pretending it was Caliburn, the brand of King Arthur, lately found at Gastonbury, during his father's antiquarian researches for the tomb of that king. Richard then embarked in his favorite galley, named by him Trank the Mare. He had previously, in honoring his betrothment, instituted an order of twenty-four knights, who pledged themselves in a fraternity with the king, to scale the walls of Acre, and that they might be known in the storming of that city, the king appointed them to wear a blue band of leather on the left leg, from which they were called knights of the blue thong. The season of Lent prevented the immediate marriage of Richard and his betrothed, and as etiquette did not permit the unwedded maiden, Berengaria, to embark and trank the mare under the immediate protection of her lover, she sailed, in company with Queen Joanna, in one of the strongest ships, under the care of a brave knight, called Stephen de Turnham. After these arrangements, Richard led the van of the fleet, in Trank the Mare, bearing a huge lantern at her poop, to rally the fleet in the darkness of night. Thus, with a hundred and fifty ships and fifty galleys, and accompanied by his bride and his sister, did lion-hearted Richard hoist sail for Palestine, where Philip Augustus had already indolently commenced the siege of Acre. Syrian virgins wail and weep, English Richard ploughs the deep. But we must turn a deaf ear to the bewitching meter of polished verse, and quote details taken by peers of Langtoft, from the Provençal comrade of Richard and Berengaria's crusade voyage. Till King Richard be forward, he may have no rest. Acres then is his tryst, upon Saracen fiends. To venge Jesu Christ, hitherward he wends. The king's sister Joanne, and Lady Berengar, foremost sailed with ilk one. Next them his chancellor Richard Mansell. The chancellor so height, his tide fell not well. A tempest on him light, his ship was down borne, himself there to die. The king's seal was lost, with other galleys to weigh. Lady Joanna she the Lord Jesu besought, in Cyprus she might be to heaven quickly brought. The maiden Berengar, she was sore affright, that neither far nor near, her king rode in sight. Queen Joanna was alarmed for herself, but the maiden Berengaria only thought of Richard's safety. Bernard, the treasurer, does not allow that Joanna was quite so much frightened. 
we translate his words queen joanna's galley sheltered in the harbor of lemusa when isaac the lord of cyprus sent two boats and demanded if the queen would land she declined the offer saying all she wanted was to know if the king of england had passed they replied they did not know at that juncture isaac approached with a great power upon which the chevaliers who guarded the royal ladies got the galley in order to be rowed out of the harbor at the first indication of hostility meantime isaac who saw berengaria on board demanded what damsel that was with them they declared she was the sister of the king of navarre whom the king of england's mother had brought for him to espouse isaac seemed so angry at this intelligence that stephen de turnham gave signal to heave up the anchor and the queen's galley rowed with all speed into the offing when the gale had somewhat abated king richard after mustering his navy found not only that the ship was missing wherein were drowned both the chancellor of england and the great seal but the galley that bore the precious freight of his sister and his bride he immediately sailed from a friendly cretan harbor in search of his lost ships when arrived off cyprus he entered the bay of famagusta and beheld the galley that contained his princesses laboring heavily and tossing in the offing he became infuriated with the thought that some wrong had been offered to them and leaped armed as he was into the first boat that could be prepared his anger increased on learning that the queen's galley had put into the bay in the storm but had been driven inhospitably from shelter by the threats of the greek despot at the time of richard's landing isaac and all his islanders were busily employed in plundering the wreck of the chancellor's ship and two english transports then stranded on the cypriot shore as this self-styled emperor though in behavior worse than a pagan professed to be a christian richard at his first landing sent him a civil message suggesting the propriety of leaving off plundering his wrecks to this isaac returned with an impertinent answer saying that whatever goods the sea threw on his island he should take without asking leave of any one they shall be brought full dear by jesu heaven's king with this saying richard battle-axe in hand led his crusaders so boldly to the rescue that the mock emperor and his cypriots scampered into limusa the capital of the island much faster than they had left it freed from the presence of the inhospitable despot king richard made signals to joanna's galley to enter the harbor berengaria half dead with fatigue and terror was welcomed on shore by the conquering king when says the chronicler there was joy and love enow as soon as isaac comnensis was safe behind the walls of his citadel he sent a message to request a conference with king richard who expected that he had a little lowered the despot's pride but when they met isaac was so full of vaporing and boasting that he elicited from king richard an aside in english and as cour de lyon then uttered the only words in our language he ever was known to speak it is well they have been recorded by chronicle ha de devil exclaimed king richard he speak like a foul breton as isaac and richard could not come to any terms of pacification the despot retreated to a stronghold in a neighboring mountain while richard after making a speech to the londoners we hope in more choice english than the above instigating them to the storm of the cypriot capital with promise of plunder led them on to the attack axe in hand the londoners easily captured lemusa directly the coast was clear of isaac and his myrmidons magnificent preparations were made in lemusa for the nuptials and coronation of king richard and berengaria we are able to describe the appearance made by these royal personages at this high solemnity king richard's costume we may suppose very little from that in which he gave audience to the despot isaac a day after the marriage had taken place a satin tunic of rose colored was belted round his waist his mantle was of striped silver tissue brocaded with silver half moons his sword of fine damascus steel had a hilt of gold and a silver scaled sheath on his head he wore a scarlet bonnet brocaded in gold with figures of animals he bore a truncheon in his hand 
His Spanish steed was led before him, saddled and bitted with gold, and the saddle was inlaid with precious stones. Two little golden lions were fixed on it, in the place of a crouper. They were figured with their paws raised, in act to strike each other. In this attire, Vinisolf adds, that Richard, who had yellow curls, a bright complexion, and a figure like Mars himself, appeared a perfect model of military and manly grace. The effigy of Queen Berengaria, at Espan, clearly presents her as a bride, a circumstance which is ascertained by the flowing tresses, royal matrons always wearing their hair covered, or else closely braided. Her hair is parted, a la vierge, on the brow, a transparent veil, open on each side, like the Spanish mantillas, hangs behind, and covers the rich tresses at their length. The veil is confined by a regal diadem, of peculiar splendor, studded with several bands of gems, and surmounted by fleur de lis, to which so much foliage is added, as to give it an appearance of a double crown, perhaps because she was crowned queen of Cyprus as well as England. Our antiquaries affirm that the peculiar character of Berengaria's elegant but singular style of beauty brings conviction to every one who looks on her effigy that it is a carefully finished portrait. At his marriage, King Richard proclaimed a great feast. To Lemusa the lady was led, his feast the king did cry, Berengar will be wed, and sojourn thereby. The third day of the feast, Bishop Bernard of Bayonne, Nude off the guest, to the queen he gave the crown. And there in the joyous month of May, 1191, says an ancient writer, in the flourishing and spacious isle of Cyprus, celebrated as the very abode of the goddess of love, did King Richard solemnly take to wife his beloved lady Berengaria. By the consent of the Cypriots, wearied of Isaac's tyranny, and by the advice of the allied crusaders who came to assist at his nuptials, Richard was crowned king of Cyprus, and his bride queen of England and Cyprus. Soon after, the fair heiress of Cyprus, daughter to the despot Isaac, came and threw herself at the feet of Richard. Lord king, she said, have mercy on me. When the king courteously put forth his hand to lift her from the ground, and sent her to his wife and his sister Joanna. As many historical scandals are afloat respecting the Cypriot princess, implying that Richard, captivated by the distressed beauty, from that moment forsook his queen, it is well to observe the words of an eyewitness, who declares, that Richard sent the lady directly to his queen, from whom she never parted till after their return to Europe. The surrender of the Cypriot princess was followed by the capture of her father, whom the king of England bound in silver chains, richly gilt, and presented to Queen Berengaria as her captive. After the conclusion of the nuptials and coronation of Berengaria, her royal bridegroom once more hoisted his flag on his good galley, Trenk the Mare, and set sail, in beautiful summer weather, for Palestine. Berengaria and her sister-in-law again sailed, under the protection of Stephen de Turnham, such being safer than companionship with the warlike Richard. Their galley made the port of Acre before the Trenk the Mare. On their arrival at Acre, though, says Bernard Le Tresorer, it was very grievous to the king of France to know that Richard was married to any other than his sister, yet he received Berengaria with great courtesy, taking her in his arms, and lifting her on shore himself, from the boat to the beach. Richard appeared before Acre on the long bright day of St. Barnabas, when the whole allied army, elated by the naval victory he had won by the way, marched to the beach to welcome their companion. The earth shook with footsteps of the Christians, and the sound of their shouts. When Acre was taken, Richard established his queen and sister safely there. They remained at Acre with the Cypriot princess, during the whole of the Syrian campaign, under the care of Richard's castellans, Bertrand de Verdun, and Stephen de Munchensis. To the left of the mosque at Acre are the ruins of a palace, called to this day King Richard's Palace. This was doubtless the abode of Berengaria. There is not a more pleasant spot in history than the tender friendship of Berengaria and Joanna, who formed an attachment amidst the perils and terrors of storm and siege, ending only with their lives. 
how quaintly yet expressively is their gentle and feminine love for each other marked by the sweet simplicity of the words they held each other dear and lived as doves in cage noting at the same time the harem-like seclusion in which the royal ladies dwelt while sharing the crusade campaign it was from the citadel of acre that richard tore down the banner of leopold archduke of austria who was the uncle of the cypriot lady her captivity was the real matter of dispute we have little space to dwell on richard's deeds of romantic valor in palestine on the capture of ascalon or the battle of jaffa before which city was killed richard's good steed named fanuel whose feats in battle were nearly as much celebrated by the troubadours as those of his master after the death of fanuel richard was obliged to fight on foot the courteous saladin who saw him thus battling was shocked that so accomplished a cavalier should be dismounted and sent him as a present a magnificent arab charger richard had the precaution to order one of his knights to mount the charger first the headstrong beast no sooner found a stranger on his back than he took the bit between his teeth and refusing all control galloped back to his own quarters carrying the christian knight into the midst of saladin's camp if king richard had ridden the wilful animal he would in like manner have been at the mercy of the saracens saladin was so much ashamed of the misbehavior of his present that he could scarcely look up while he apologized to the christian knight for it appeared as if he had laid a trap for the liberty of king richard he sent back the knight mounted on a more manageable steed on which richard rode to the end of the campaign king richard during his syrian campaign was once within sight of jerusalem but never took it while he was with his queen berengaria at acre an incident befell him of which they joined bill the companion in arms of st louis has thus preserved the memory in those times when hugh duke of burgundy and king richard of england were abiding at acre they received intelligence that they might take jerusalem if they choose for its garrison had gone to the assistance of damascus the duke of burgundy and king richard accordingly marched towards the holy city richard's battalions led the way while burgundy's force brought up the rear but when king richard drew near to jerusalem intelligence was brought him that the duke of burgundy had turned back with his division out of pure envy that it might not be said that the king of england had taken jerusalem as these tidings were discussing one of the king of england's knights cried out sire sire only come hither and i will show you jerusalem but the king throwing down his weapons said with tears in his eyes and hands uplifted to heaven ah lord god i pray thee that i may never see thy holy city jerusalem since things thus happen and since i cannot deliver it from the hands of thy enemies richard could do nothing more than return to his queen and sister at acre you must know that this king richard performed such deeds of prowess when he was in the holy land that the saracens on seeing their horses frightened at the shadow or a bush cried out to them what dost thou think melech rick is there this they were accustomed to say from the many times he had vanquished them in like manner when the children of turks or saracens cried out their mother said to them hush hush or i will give you to king richard and from the terror of these words the babes were instantly quiet the provencal historian affirms that the final truce between richard and saladin was concluded in a fair flowery meadow near mount tabor where richard was so much charmed with the gallant bearing of the prince of miscretants as saladin is civilly termed in the crusading treaties that he declared he would rather be friend of the brave and honest pagan than the ally of the crafty philip or the brutal leopold the autumn of eleven ninety two had commenced when king richard concluded his peace with saladin and prepared to return covered with fruitless glory to his native dominions a mysterious estrangement had at this time taken place between him and berengaria yet the chroniclers do not mention that any rival had supplanted the queen but merely that accidents of war had divided him from her company as for the cypriot princess if he was estranged from his queen he must likewise have been separated from the fair captive since she always remained with berengaria the king bade farewell to his queen and sister and saw them embark 
the very evening of his own departure. The queens were accompanied by the Cypriot princess, and sailed from Acre, under the care of Stephen de Turnham, September the 29th. Richard meant to return by a different route across Europe. He traveled in the disguise of a Templar, and embarked in a ship belonging to the master of the temple. This vessel was wrecked off the coast of Istria, which forced Richard to proceed homewards through the domains of his enemy, Leopold of Austria. But to his ignorance of geography is attributed his near approach to Leopold's capital. After several narrow escapes, a page sent by Richard to purchase provisions at a village near Vienna was recognized by an officer who had made the late crusade with Leopold. The boy was seized, and after enduring cruel torments, he confessed where he had left his master. When Leopold received certain intelligence where Richard harbored, the inn was searched, but not a soul found there bore any appearance of the king. No, said the people, there is no one here, without he be the templar in the kitchen, now turning the fowls which are roasting for dinner. The officers of Leopold took the hint, and went into the kitchen, where, in fact, was seated a templar, very busy turning the spit. The Austrian chevalier, who had served in the crusade, knew him and said quickly, There he is, seize him. Coeur de Lyon started from the spit, and did battle for his liberty right valiantly, but was overborne by numbers. The revengeful Leopold immediately imprisoned his gallant enemy, and immured him so closely in a Styrian castle called Tenenbrus, that for months no one knew whether the lion-hearted king was alive or dead. Richard, whose heroic name was the theme of admiration in Europe, and the burden of every song, seemed vanished from the face of the earth. End of section one.